we haven't done a whole lot yet with um, some of the basic concepts for Unit 4 because, honestly, you're not going to see that many questions dealing with this stuff. But I'm going to run through a few of the definitions just to make sure we've got them now. The first thing that I want to do is the three different types of money. Going from the most basic or the most primitive to what we actually use today. So, starting with the first one. First meaning the one that's that's been in use the longest. We have commodity money. Commodity money means pretty much what it looks like it means. You have some commodity, a good that has other purposes, that also functions as money. For example, thinking back to early North American history, when you had Indian tribes using wampum as money, you know, that could also be made into other things. If you have um, tribes in Africa using cows as money, obviously a cow has other purposes than money. Not the most convenient thing to carry around, not as durable as coins, um, not as divisible as, you know, a dollar that can be broken down into smaller units. And yet, this is the most primitive type of money that we have in uh, world history. The second type, getting a little bit more complicated, is representative money. Representative money means that whatever you are using as currency represents a specific quantity of a precious metal. You know, gold and silver would be very typical for this. When the United States and a lot of other countries in the world were on the gold standard, that was a representative system. Then that meant that um, the specific amount in coins and bills was backed by that quantity of a precious metal. Several so months ago, we got as change from, you know, just some transaction in the store, a dollar bill that was so old it actually had printed on it the word silver certificate, meaning that it was printed long enough ago that it still says that it's backed by a quantity of silver. So that is a representative money system. The major drawback of using representative money is that when the value of the metal changes, When the value of the metal changes, for example, when international prices for gold fluctuate, it actually affects the value of your national currency. And we moved away from the gold standard um, as a result of the Great Depression because you can't have a stable enough supply if it's going to fluctuate every time the price of gold changes. So we don't use that anymore. It's amazing how many people still think we're on the gold standard. But we're not. We haven't been for decades. What's amazing is how many people think we should be. Well, that's... A, I can't even get into that. All right. So commodity money, most basic, representative, a little more complicated, a little more versatile. And then we have number three, what we use today, which is called fiat money. It has nothing to do with the car. Fiat money is money that is not backed by a precious metal. It is legal tender. It is... Um, money that must be accepted for transactions. It is backed by the word of the government that it has value. Now, is it possible that some other good could function as money if people agree to use it that way? Yes, it's possible. Um, but fiat money, because the government says this is currency, because the government says it has value, it has value. Now, if we had um, you know, a, a, a national revolution in economic thinking such that people said, oh no, the dollar's worthless and we can't use it anymore. Could that in fact invalidate the concept of fiat money? Yeah, it could. So let's just not go there because that would suck and could collapse our banking system. So commodity money means commodities that also function as money, so goods that have some other purpose. Representative means that it represents a quantity of a precious metal. And fiat money, which does not represent anything except the promise of the government that the currency has value. All right, so we've got three types of money. Now we've got three functions of money. We, lots of things coming in threes in this unit. 
better than, you know, having a list of You will be visited by three spirits. You can stop now. Okay. So for the functions of money, um, we're looking at things that money actually does. First one. It's not money. the function of money past, is it? I'm sorry. Continue, please. All right. The first one, and this is the one with which people are most familiar, is that money is a medium of exchange. Now, the term medium refers to some substance through which things pass. So what this means is that it is through money that exchanges happen. In other words, when you buy something, you give money, you get the thing that you're buying. That's money as a medium of exchange. That's what that's talking about. The second one is money as a store of value. Store of value. What that means is when you put money away, let's say you put money in a savings account, you put money in a checking account, when you store money, you expect it to be stable. You expect it to still have value when you take the money and try to use it. If you put money in the bank, let's say you have $1,000 in a savings account, and the economy starts to experience this period of ridiculously rapid inflation, well, that means that money as a store of value is not functioning properly. Because the longer you leave the money in the bank, the less it's worth. So when you have periods of rapid inflation, that is a disincentive for savings. Meaning, if the money is losing its stored value, people will get it and spend it. Because they look at it in terms of what the money is actually worth in terms of buying power. So if you're going to put money in the bank, if you're going to stuff money in your mattress, if you're going to put you know, the buried gold coins in your backyard, you expect that when you go to get that, it will retain its value. And if it doesn't, then you have no incentive to leave it there. So money is used for exchanges when you buy things. Money is a store of value when you put it aside because presumably when you go to get it, it will still be worth something. Now the third one, and this one is, I don't know, sometimes it can be a little misleading. Money is a unit of account. Now what that means is, what we tend to do is look at the price, and we believe that price implies something about worth. Price implies worth. In other words, if something is very expensive, we tend to think that it's higher quality. That is not always true. Take a Mercedes Benz as an example. Well, I wasn't going to go there. Um, but anyhow, money is a unit of account. We tend to equate price with worthiness, with quality. Um, so that if something costs more, we think that we're getting more for our money. Um, now, what I would use to debunk this principle or, or to... Uh, you know, to throw in a note of caution here, is that, for example, if you're going to the mall and you drop 100 bucks on a pair of jeans, they're probably made in a lot of the same sweatshops as the jeans you could go buy, say, at Target for $15. You know, what are you actually paying for? A brand name, the brick and mortar store at the mall, um, you know, maybe a slight difference in style and cut. But is that really quality? No, it's not. But people tend to believe, and there have been some psych psychological studies done on this, that when you spend more money, you're getting more, and thus you are happier. Um, but again, you, you got to be careful about you know, making that absolutely equal. Anyhow, we have three types of money, three functions of money. Use it to buy stuff. You save it and we use it to judge what something is actually worth in terms of value or quality.